There have been murmurings for some time that the Supreme Court judges would rule against the government's plans to send migrants to Rwanda. The rest of Europe has seen a sharp increase in the number of small boats, but it is a fact that there are fewer migrants crossing the channel to get to the UK compared to last year. This means that fewer people are needlessly dying, people smuggling gangs have less power, and the public are having to cough up less to foot the asylum seeker accommodation bill. Could it be that the prospect of the Rwanda deal is already working as a deterrent? Sat Suella has had to deal with Sunak, which involved taking on the ECHR, and knew she had the backing of many MPs, all ready to go to battle once the Supreme Court ruling was announced. For any major policy change to be implemented in principle, the principle of collective responsibility has to be met. And that means that all the members of the cabinet have to agree. So Rishi Sunak used his reshuffle to fill his top table with Remainer MPs, politicians who would never consider any changes to our relationship with Strasbourg or a foreign court having jurisdiction in the UK. And perhaps most importantly, he made sure that the most powerful post of all, the Foreign Secretary, was held by a die-hard Remainer, someone who would never compromise our membership of the ECHR. But how did he pull this off? Well, I suspect a deal was made between William Hague and the Downing Street fixer, Dougie Smith, who between them had already greased the wheels of Sunak's selection to his Richmond seat. Enter Lord Cameron, job done. On my panel tonight is former advisor to Jeremy Corbyn, James Schneider, and Telegraph columnist, Madeleine Grant. Madeleine, so Rishi Sunak's plan was, is to get this through the Commons. Do you think he'll be able to do that? They want to bring in emergency legislation. Yeah. Um, you know, we've got the Lords as well of who course. are going to have to sort of get this through the Lords. You can't just go through the Commons and be made into legislation overnight. Do you think it's going to work or is this his magical thinking? I think this could take a very long time. Like, I don't think that based on all of that that you, you've, you've, you've rightly pointed out. I mean, Commons, I expect, you know, there is still a majority, but by no means the 80 seat one that they started. I think it's now like 50 or just under 50 majority now. And there are a lot of MPs that would be, you know, are, are not exactly on very strong believers in this policy at the best of times. And then, of course, you've got the Lords where there could be the endless ping pong back and forth new amendments and all the rest of it. This will swallow up a lot of time and Rishi Sunak doesn't have a very long time at all. You know, we're probably looking at an election within the year. We're probably looking at an election in about six months. Yeah. So it could be next May. And there's, you know, and I knowing how long legislation takes to get through, I just, I just don't know what this is. I yes. think Swala Bratham is quite right when she says this. This is magical thinking. Yeah. It also shows a kind of like a sense of naivety in terms of knowing the process and knowing what can happen. You've just highlighted the less than 50 MPs. We've got Damien Green on tonight, who heads up the One Nation group. I think there are far more MPs who are completely opposed to yeah. the Rwanda plan, who given that we're getting close to election, his own MPs are likely not to vote it through. Do you yeah. think he knows that, James? Do you think he's counting on that? I, I'm assuming that he's counting on getting it through, but I think I mean, with the whole Rwanda plan and his deal with Suella Braverman, he's painted himself into a corner and now he's now he's stuck in it and he can't you know, jump out from his troubled corner into safer waters or whatever the right metaphor would be. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sure he knows that it's going to be extremely tricky, but they've got to roll the dice and, and try to do something. But there's, you know, many things uh, stopping in the way. And this thing, which I can't imagine is his his actual top priority of the things that he actually really wants to do could end up being what defines him, his struggle to get people uh, on planes to Rwanda. Yeah. There's, um, did he say there'll be a plane leaving for Rwanda before the end of the year? That's, what, in five, six weeks' time? Yeah. I mean, that just isn't going to happen. No, no. that's not going to happen. No, no, not no. with the legislative schedule. But what I don't understand is why did he make such a statement? Well, he who advised him that that could happen? Yeah, where, where is the expectation management? Yeah. And, I mean, even stop the boats, that kind of implies stop the boats altogether, which was always an impossible task. So, actually, the fact that they have had some success securing a deal with Albania and sending back... 90% um, of Albanian arrivals now get sent back, I believe. And, and that's been an actual success, and they are doing better than many other countries in Europe on this issue, but that's not how it seems because of the very poor management of expectations. So, and also, there's this interesting scenario where he's filled the Cabinet with... 
I mean, is it the case that I think it's the case that there are more camera advisors around the cabinet table now than there are any other kind of MP, which is bizarre. The fact that he's brought David Cameron, I mean, it's quite a shock, David Cameron getting out of that car in Downing Street on Monday morning. I mean, I've said this so many times this week, you know, it's um, if you went to Eton, you know, somebody has a word with the king, you get popped into the House of Lords, you get given foreign secretary. David Cameron, who's been, what, at home for seven years, you know, in his shepherd's hut, shooting stag on the grouse moors, got bored, obviously. I don't think that's an uncommon opinion that he's obviously got bored and he's been popped into stuff. But the reason why is that David Cameron will never, with collective responsibility, you have this thing called right round. Every, every cabinet member has to agree to the policy. David Cameron is never going to agree to any interference with Strasbourg or the ECHR. Rishi Sunak knows that the pressure is going to be coming in from the Commons, from his own MPs to do exactly that. And in a way, he's put up this wall, this bulwark. He can say, I mm. can't do it, I can't get the Cabinet to support me, and I can't have another reshuffle. And the reason why he can't get the Cabinet to support him is he's put the people in Cabinet that he knows will prevent this will present this scenario, which will make any, any tampering with the ECHR impossible. I mean, it's an absolute mess, isn't it? Well, I, I mean, Cameron did actually, when he was Prime Minister, did push back against something to do with uh, ECHR with um, votes for prisoners. The court ruled that <clears throat> they should be given and they changed some legislation and they had a fudge and they said that they that they did it. So I'm not convinced that the this coding of Remainers and Brexiteers, I mean, Rishi Sunak voted for, voted for Brexit, we've left the EU, Think, things have moved on a little bit. Um, but that said, I think the Cameron appointment was a kind of short-term win with storing up longer-term issues. I mean, the, the purpose of it was knock Suella Braverman off the front pages with the reshuffle, and that worked. You saw the front pages, they're all wham, bam, in comes Cam or whatever. But now he has to deal with him as, uh, as Foreign Secretary, and that's got, uh, you know, that's got a number of problems. Not least, I think, the, the fact that he's got this huge lobbying scandal that's... Uh, yeah, well, you know, we'll, call, we'll talk more about David Cameron in part two. Let's just go back, I don't want to lose Rwanda, so let's just go back to Rwanda a minute. James, uh, Madeline, Rwanda, uh, so much work has been done into, you know, making this treaty, yeah. ensuring that Rwanda is a fit place to process asylum applications. It seems to be working as a deterrent. Yet the kickback against Rwanda, a kickback against this happening, seems to me to be utterly bizarre, considering how many illegal immigrants we have flooding into the UK every day. And the people who suffer most from this, of course, are the poorer communities yeah. who have to take the brunt of this. Do you see a problem? What's, what's your perspective on Rwanda? I don't see it. I lived in Africa for a year. I see no problem with it. What's your perspective on that? Well, I mean, I always, I remember thinking this seems unworkable when I heard, it seemed a bit harebrained to me when it was first described. But then I thought about it some more and it, I really, the impression that I got was that Labour don't care about this issue at all. They don't, it's not a priority for them. It's not, they, they dismiss everything that the government attempts to do. And their magic solution is to come up with some deal with the EU where you potentially agree to take even more migrants than you already take, um, you know, via some kind of intermediary in Brussels. Um, and and that, therefore, that what the Conservatives were offering, although it seemed like, you know, destined to fail, they were at least visibly attempting to do something about it. And I thought, you know, people don't really object to the idea on principle what they object to is that it hasn't worked. You know, it's, it's unworkable. Um, and, you know, this is, this is not going away. And I, whoever is in charge, this will be an issue and they will need to have an answer for it. So, uh, James, what is Labour's plan? I mean, the Labour pl Labour's plan is... The, well, Labour's answer to a plan is, our plan is to stop the... to get a plan, mm. to stop the criminal gangs. That's not a plan. To have a plan to have a plan is not a plan, <laughs> is it? No, it's not. I mean, I'm very much not a spokesperson for the Labour Party, so I couldn't tell you what their, <laughs> what, uh, what their policy on this is. But I think that their general approach is to mimic the government's position, but with providing some kind of technical criticism. So their opposition to the Rwanda deal was not on the basis that it was... Um, that, that it was immoral or, or that it wasn't actually dealing with the issues that uh, we need with, within the asylum system. It's that it's unworkable and it's costly. And that's what their approach has been the, the whole way. And I think that's what they'll continue to, they'll continue to do. So